Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, we're very pleased to have Jamal Kovac from University of Toronto. Jamal is uh, finishing up his PhD and he's on the job market next year. So reach, uh, reach out to him for that. Uh, and he's speaking on um, the approximate Ramsey properties of uh, fresh air spaces. Jamal? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the, for the introduction and for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, so yeah, today I want to tell you about some, some relatively recent interactions between uh, Ramsey theory and uh, functional analysis. In particular, I want to tell you about some uh, Ramsey properties of fresh air spaces. Uh, and I should mention uh, this talk contains some joint work with my co-supervisor, Jordi lopez -Abad. So this is, there's no preprint or anything yet. Um, a lot of things are still being written up, uh, but most of what's in here should be, should be correct. So, okay. Uh, good. Okay, so it's just some motivation. Um, so most of the motivation for what we're doing um, comes from topological dynamics. And in particular, we're interested in, in, a, in a property that topological groups can have, uh, and which is well studied by uh, people working in that field. So uh, just to start off, so we have uh, some topological group G. So we say it's extremely amenable if whenever I have a continuous action of G on a compact house or space X, you can find a common fixed point. So I can find some point X in the space so that uh, if I apply G, right, any element of this group G to it, uh, I, I get back X. So it's a, you can think of it as a very strong uh, fixed point property. So in, 90, in 1977, uh, Veach showed that no locally compact group, topological group has this property. So it was thought for a while that these groups are, are in some sense pathological. And initially, in fact, people didn't even know if there were any, any naturally occurring examples. So is this a pathological property? Well, if it was, then I wouldn't be giving this talk. So surprisingly, the answer is no. Uh, and in fact, there's a lot of natural examples of topological groups uh, that have this, this property. So uh, in 1983, Gromov and Mailman showed that uh, if you take the unitary group of the infinite dimensional Hilbert space, then this is extremely amenable. Uh, Pestov showed that if you take the automorphism group, so all uh, bijections preserving the order uh, of the rationals equipped with uh, topology of pointwise convergence, then this is also extremely amenable. Uh, and just another nice example, if you take the automorphism group of a standard probability space, then this is also uh, another example. Um, so a lot of the examples that, that we know of today and that um, showed up early on were, were sort of out of this form. So you have some nice structure and some, some notion of uh, a structure preserving automorphism. Um, and typically these, these groups are equipped with uh, the topology of pointwise convergence, which I guess for us is uh, the same as a strong operator topology. Um, so there are a lot of nice natural examples of, uh, of these groups. So one, one good source, one sort of uh, rich source of, of examples come from theory of metric structures. So I, I won't go through um, all the, the technicalities from, from continuous logic, but I just wanna give you an idea of, of how this goes. So here we have a metric structure, which is just some uh, some structure A or some set A uh, with possibly some additional structure um, as well as a distinguished metric. So this metric is an important part of, uh, of this structure. Uh, and just for technical reasons, we want this space to be a complete metric space. Okay. So if you have one of these structures and this is, this is as general as, as I'll get today. Um, if you have one of these structures um, an embedding is just a, ma a linear ma a mapping which preserves all the present structure and which also preserves the metric. So in particular, it's always going to be uh, an injective mapping and an isometry because it's uh, preserving the metric in particular. And then an automorphism of, of one of these structures is just a subjective uh, self-embedding. So we can, we can sort of ask about the group of automorphisms of one of these structures in general. And it turns out that um, as long as these automorphism groups are sufficiently rich, uh, we can get a lot of examples of extremely amenable groups. So what do I mean by sufficiently rich? So it's characterized by this, uh, this property. So, and, and you might've seen um, the usual notions of what it means for a structure to be uh, homogeneous. I think in this seminar, actually, uh, there was a talk fairly recently about uh, homogeneous Banach lattices. Uh, so this is the same, same sort of definition. 
So if you have a, a metric structure A, uh, we say it's approximately ultra homogeneous if whenever I take uh, any epsilon positive, so this is some error, right? And I have some embedding, uh, call it gamma, of some finitely generated substructure B of A uh, into A, I can always find an automorphism of the big structure, which almost extends uh, gamma, right, up to some error. So if I just restrict to these uh, generators, uh, B0 up to Bn, uh, then the distance, right, so remember this distance is, is a part of this structure, right? This distance between uh, gamma of Bi and uh, G of Bi is, is always less than epsilon. So in some sense, you can, right, you can't always exactly extend these, uh, right, these embeddings, uh, but you can do so up to an arbitrary error. So this is, uh, right, this is sort of formalizing the fact that um, these automorphism groups are, are rich. So there's a lot of them. Okay, and two motivating examples for us uh, will be the following. So the Ursun space. So this is the unique up to isometry, uh, separable universal ultra homogeneous natural space. Uh, and if, if you're familiar with this very safe stuff, so I'm not gonna uh, focus too much on, on the general setting, um, you can view this as some sort of limit of the class of all finite dimensional, uh, of finite metric spaces rather. And then the Gurari space. So this is the unique separable universal uh, approximately ultra homogeneous Banach space. So this in the context of Fresse, this is going to be the Fresse limit of uh, class of all finite dimensional Banach spaces. So these, these are the examples that uh, we sort of keep in mind when working with um, these sorts of metric structures. Uh, and in fact, I, I'm not going to focus on anything more general than, than what you see here. Okay, um, so if you have one of these nice structures whose automorphism group is sufficiently rich in, in the sense that we just saw, uh, there's a nice way to show that you have extreme amenability in those cases. So before 2005, most, most of these known results uh, were proved using concentration of measure. Uh, so it's just a purely analytic phenomenon and no, no combinatorics at all. Um, but the one, one main sort of exception uh, is Pestoff's proof that the automorphism group of the rationals with the usual order is extremely amenable. So, and this in fact made, uh, made essential use of a finite Ramsey theorem. Uh, so this, this was generalized um, in the following way. So working with metric structures, right? We, we want a notion of an approximate Ramsey property. So if you have one of these classes, call it K, it has the approximate Ramsey property. If whenever I take two, uh, two of these metric structures, X and Y, some number of colors R uh, and some error epsilon, uh, I can find a sufficiently large Z also in the same class so that the following holds. Right? So that whenever I color the embeddings, right? so these are just the structure preserving uh, mappings from X into Z. So if I color this space with R many colors, uh, I can always find some gamma, right, which embeds Y into Z. So this, you can think of this as some copy of Y into, into the big space uh, and some color I, so that whenever I take this set, so this is just a set of all uh, compositions of the form gamma with some embedding of X into Y. Right? So I take any, any copy, right? think of these as copies. I take any copy of X and Y, which lives in the bigger copy of Y and Z. Right? I take any such embedding, uh, then I can always find something nearby which has this fixed color I. Okay? So right, the, these, these sets aren't exactly monochromatic. Right? We're not saying that uh, everything of this form has the same color, but they're nearby something with the same color up to an arbitrary error. Okay, and this distance D again, just comes from, uh, from the metric structures. Okay, uh, so initially this was proved, so that there's this um, so-called hecker's pestoff dorchebis correspondence, uh, which gives a link between extreme amenability and the Ramsey property. So initially this was proved in the case of just uh, usual first order structures. So without a metric, right? Um, just arbitrary structures in, uh, in the sense of model theory. So they proved that. And then the, the version I'm, I'm listing here is due to Mallory and Sankov. So this is sort of the general form. So if you have 
uh, some structure which is approximately ultra homogeneous. And you take the class of all finitely generated substructures of this, this big structure K, uh, then it turns out that the automorphism group is extremely amenable precisely when this class K has the approximate Ramsey property. So it gives you a characterization of, of when you have extreme amenability for these structures at least. So this is nice. Um, people, people like Ramsey properties. Um, it's well, they're well studied. Um, not so much in the approximate setting, but at least in the discrete setting, there's a lot of uh, nice examples of Ramsey classes. Right? So this tells us, um, right, this gives us another way of, of finding extremely amenable groups. Um, and I should mention that, uh, you know, th this concentration of measure phenomenon, if, I mean, I guess if you're an analyst, maybe that it's more natural <laughs> to work with that than, than using the combinatorics. Uh, but for someone like me, uh, <laughs> checking the Ramsey property, um, I guess makes makes a lot more intuitive sense. Um, so it's it's a nice way of uh, of getting these these extremely minimal groups. Oh, and sorry, there's a question in the chat. Um, what's the topology on the automorphism group? Uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. So um, I I won't answer that in general. I'll, I'll answer it once we get to some specific examples. Because um, again, I don't want to focus too much on the the, the really general aspects. Uh, I just want to convince you that there's there's a nice connection between uh, metric structures in general and um, right using the Ramsey property to get uh, extreme amenability. So we'll see some some concrete examples of, of which topology I'm looking at. It's it's usually just the topology of pointwise convergence. Um, okay, good. So let's move on to the structures that we're we're actually interested in uh, for this talk. So. Uh, recall that a Frechet space is just a locally convex topological vector space, uh, which is completely metrizable via translation invariant metric. So, okay, this is a nice example, but it's it's nicer to work with semi-norms. Okay. So, if you have one of these spaces, um, right, remember that you can always find a sequence of semi-norms that induces the same the same topology on X. So, rather than working with this uh, more, I guess, abstract definition. Uh, it's more convenient to think of Frechet spaces as just being uh, some topological vector space equipped with a nice uh, family of semi norms. So, for us, so the definition that I'll, I'll always be using when I talk about Frechet spaces uh, is the following. So, it's some pair X together with a sequence of semi norms, um, which, which may or may not be uh, infinite, right? So, right up here, I, I, I listed this as an infinite sequence of semi norms, but um, it's conceivable that this sequence is eventually constant, right? Um, for instance, if I have a Banach space, I just have one semi-norm. So for us, this, uh, these Frechet spaces will always be uh, of this form. So you have X uh, topological, topological vector space. This lambda X, um, you can think of as, as the length of the space. Uh, so it's just measuring the, the length of the sequence of semi-norms. So it's either finite or, or infinite. And then you have the sequence of semi-norms, which turns X into, um, into a Frechet space. Okay, so we'll always be thinking of a Frechet spaces in this, in this sense um, for, for a few reasons that will maybe become clear later. Uh, okay. Good, so, right, we want to come up with a, um, a notion of ultra homogeneity in this setting. So in the abstract setting that I was um, looking at earlier, uh, there was only one, one metric there. Now here, if we want to view uh, for shade spaces as you know, some tuple, uh, some space with a tuple of, uh, or with a sequence of semi-norms, um, we actually want to preserve each of those semi-norms. So an embedding in this setting is much stronger than, than the usual motion. So if you have two uh, for shade spaces, X and Y, and just for convenience, I'm assuming when I have an embedding, I'm going to assume that um, X has uh, less or equal semi norms than, than Y. Right. So if you have some epsilon positive, then you say that um, this injective linear mapping gamma is an epsilon isometric embedding uh, if it's an embedding up to, uh, up to epsilon, right? So just the usual notion of an epsilon isometry. But we want this to hold for every semi norm that we see. For X at least. 
So again, this is much stronger than um, the usual notion. Uh, and then of course you have an isometric embedding if uh, the seminorms are, are always preserved. Okay, just some notation. So um, again, this only makes sense in certain settings, um, but I mean, it, you know, in some cases this, this set might be empty, um, but in general, we'll, we'll use this notation uh, EMBXY to denote the set of all uh, isometric embeddings from X into Y. And then ISO of X is just all the uh, surjective isometric embeddings. Okay, so once we have this, now we can formulate a useful notion of uh, approximate ultra homogeneity. So uh, if you have a class K of Frechet spaces, uh, and here, sorry, I have this F here, um, just ignore that, that'll come up later. So you just have some collection of uh, Frechet spaces, usually finite dimensional for us. Uh, and you have some, some Frechet space E with an infinite sequence of seminorms. So we'll see that it's approximately K ultra homogeneous if whenever I take some Frechet space X in this collection, some error epsilon, and I look at two different ways of embedding X into this big space, uh, I can always move one of the images uh, sufficiently close to the other. Okay? So I can find some isometry G so that when I compose uh, G with gamma and I look at the operator norm. So th this is going to be just the, the version of the operator norm for the nth n seminorm. So this norm should be less than epsilon uh, for every seminorm that I see. So for every seminorm um, showing up for X. Okay, and then we have this notion of being uh, Frese. So uh, E is K Frese if it's separable, uh, approximately K ultra homogeneous, and if it's universal for, for K. So every, every member of K embeds isometrically into this big, this big Frese space. Okay, uh, let me pause here in case there's any, any questions. Okay, good. So we have this, um, this version of what it means to be ultra homogeneous in the setting of, of these Frechet spaces, where again, we're always thinking of Frechet spaces as uh, being equipped with a, a fixed sequence of seminars. Okay, so now let's, uh, let's look at some classes of finite dimensional Frechet spaces. Right, so what we're doing here is we're trying to build up to uh, some, some version of, of Frechet theory for these spaces. So I want to be able to associate some limit uh, to certain allowable classes of finite dimensional Frechet spaces. So there are a few properties here that we'll, um, we'll look at. I'm only gonna focus on one of them um, in the next few slides, but I'll list all these. Here for you. So K has the hereditary property if basically it's closed under embeddings. Uh, sorry, is there a question? Yeah, but uh, finite dimensional Frechet space are the same as finite dimensional Banach spaces. So... Well, you could take um, yeah. So that that's that's one sort of approach that we had initially. So if you have a finite dimensional Frechet space with just a finite sequence of seminorms. Um, one thing you could try is taking the maximum uh, of all the seminorms you see. So that would induce the same topology. But the problem for us is that we're interested in preserving, right? if, if we have an isometric embedding, we want to preserve each seminorm individually. So you sort of lose information about the isometries if you do that. Uh, so in general, for us, no. Okay, 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 okay. Okay. Uh, so we have this hereditary okay. property, which just says that if I have some member of this class and I embed some, um, right, some smaller uh, for shape space, then it's also in the class. There's this joint embedding property, which just says that if I have two, two members of my class, I can always embed them into something bigger. So this is the important one that I'm actually going to <laughs> do something with later. Uh, so the near amalgamation property. So this, this turns out to be the crucial uh, thing that you need, uh, not only in this metric setting, but in general when, when working with uh, for say classes and for say limits. So K has the near amalgamation property. If whenever I take uh, some structure X and K together with two epsilon isometric embeddings uh, into uh, these other members of K, call them Y and Z, then I can always find a large enough space uh, W Right, also in this class 
together with isometric embeddings uh, of y into w and z into w. So that if I look at the corresponding diagram, and we'll see a picture of this uh, in the next slide, um, I get sort of a, a, an almost commutative diagram up to, up to epsilon. So this is telling me that I can, I can sort of uh, put these spaces together in a nice way, right? If I embed x into, right, into some other space in two different ways, uh, I, can, I can always sort of glue them back together uh, up to some, some fixed error, right? And then we'll see this in, in a second. And this, this here is just um, sort of a technical condition um, just to make sure that we have some notion of, of countability. Because um, typically in the discrete setting when you're doing this, um, you're only working with countable classes of structures. Uh, in the metric setting, there's a different, um, there's a different way to, to talk about this. But here, since we have infinitely many seminorms and our notion of distance depends on each of these seminorms, uh, we sort of have to work around this. Um, and this is sort of just an artificial way of, of doing this. So I, uh, I don't wanna focus too much on this, um, but we have a notion of separability for these classes. So you have some, some nice countable subclass, this should be script K tilde, uh, together with a nice collection, a countable collection of nice isometric embeddings. Uh, which which do some things for you. Um, so I, I'm I'm not going to. This isn't going to come up later in the talk, so uh, I don't want to spend too much time on it. But it's just a way of formalizing that you have um, some some notion of of being separable uh, in this class. Okay, and finally, K is a first eight class if well, it includes the the zero vector space, um, and if it has the uh, hereditary property, the near amalgamation property, and, and if it's separable. So it turns out that these conditions are, are enough to build some sort of limit uh, of these classes, these first eight classes. Okay. Uh, good, so again, the, the one property that I'm going to focus on uh, for today at least is, is this one, the near amalgamation property. So let's so we'll look at an example of, of classes that have this and we'll actually check it. Uh, so there's a comment in the chat. Um, you seem to be considering graded for shape spaces in the sense of vote. Yeah, so this is exactly, this is exactly that. Um, okay, so, right, there was a bit of a spoiler earlier. I used this notation script F. Uh, so we'll define that now. So for each N, uh, F sub N is going to be the collection of all finite dimensional for shape spaces just with a sequence of seminorms uh, of length at most n. Uh, and then f is just a union of these. And then we have this notion of being rated. So I, I'm highlighting this because um, usually in practice, this is, this is a condition that's built into the definition of being, uh, of um, this sort of characterization of a fresh A space. So usually this is, this is actually asked of these sequ the sequence of seminorms. So right, this first space is graded just if the sequence of seminorms is increasing. Um, we're sort of omitting that from our definition just because you can still get some, some interesting examples um, if you exclude this, uh, but we'll also consider this class. So script G is just all the uh, graded uh, finite dimensional first spaces with a finite sequence of seminorms. And then G sub N is, uh, is similar. So just all graded. Uh, for shape spaces with a sequence of seminorms of length at most. So it turns out that each of these are per se. Uh, and again, we'll just check um, the near amalgamation property for, for one of these. So in particular for F sub N. Okay, so what do we need to do? So I have to fix some for shape spaces, X, Y, and Z equipped with a sequence of seminorms of length uh, at most n, let's say. And I start with some isometric, some epsilon isometric embeddings, uh, call them F0, F1 uh, of x into y and x into z. So what I want is, is some, uh, some large enough space w together with isometric embeddings, g0 and g1, so that this diagram commutes up to epsilon. So it might not commute exactly, uh, but up to this error, um, I want it to commute. Okay, so so the nice, the nice sort of trick here, that's not really a trick, I guess it's just a natural move, um, 
we have a sequence of seminorms, a finite sequence of seminorms. Um, so what you can do is for each, for the ith seminorm, say, you can just quotient out by the kernel. Uh, and then now if you equip this quotient space with this, this norm, right, this pure norm, you get back a Banach space, right, finite dimensional norm space. Uh, and we know we know things about finite dimensional norm spaces, and in particular, they have the near amalgamation property. So here, uh, let x i and y i just be uh, the corresponding quotients by the i and norms, uh, and then same for for z i. And then now, what you do is um, right, you want to apply the near amalgamation property for Banach spaces. Um, so you can define natural mappings uh, between x i and y i, and then similarly x i and z i. Uh, as follows. Um, so you just map, uh, right, if you look at the equivalence class of X uh, under the, uh, in the ith space, say, uh, you just map it to the corresponding class uh, of F0 of X. So I'm just turning this, this one diagram uh, into N many diagrams. Okay. Uh, and I, but, right, to do this, I have to apply the near amalgamation property uh, for Banach spaces n times. Okay. So I get uh, the sequence wi uh, finite dimensional norm spaces. Uh, so that if I look at sort of each slice of this uh, this commutative diagram, this diagram here, I get uh, I get what we want. Okay. So we're reducing the problem to um, just to looking at, at Banach spaces. Uh, and since you only have finitely many. Uh, right, according to the definition of this class, you only have finitely many of these WIs to work with, right? So I can take the product of them. Okay. So if you apply, as I said, if you apply the NEP for finite dimensional product spaces, you get uh, a WI, right, this, this finite dimensional norm space that works there, right, together with these isometric embeddings. So the, the diagram that we saw on the previous, previous slide commutes up to epsilon. Okay, so on each slice, I know that this works. So what I can do is I can just take the product. So W, which was the space we'll be looking for. So this is just going to be the product of all the WIs. Now I need this to be um, to be an element of this class F sub N. So I just take the ith seminorm uh, to be the ith coordinates evaluated with the, the norm coming from the ith space WI. So it turns out that this is this is enough. Okay? So you just define your mappings in, in, in the natural way, right? So F1, I just map Y to this tuple. And then same for G1. Uh, so these end up being isometric embeddings. Uh, and it turns out that they, they do the job for us. So this is sort of a natural, natural sort of strategy that we'll see later on when working with the Ramsey property. Um, you have this, this finite sequence. Basically, you, you have this finite sequence of, of seminorm spaces. Right, all with the same underlying space. So you can turn them into bionic spaces by just taking the quotient uh, via the kernel, right? Equip it with a nice enough, uh, with the natural uh, norm, right? Uh, and then you can use facts about uh, bionic spaces that sort of reduce the problem to something easy, easier. Okay, so the proof for the other classes is, is similar. So they all have this near amalgamation property, right? So they all have this, uh, Right. Whenever I have, when I'm in, in the setting, uh, I can always complete this diagram up to epsilon. Okay. So as I said before, it turns out that this is, in most cases, this is enough to get a first segment. Uh, and here is where uh, we have some some technical restriction. So to make the arguments work, um, we actually have to just restrict to uh, for shade spaces. With a finite sequence of semi-norms. so I mean, you could also ask similar, right? You could ask about the near amalgamation property for uh, for shape spaces with an infinite sequence of, of semi-norms. Um, and those do have a version of that. But the the arguments that we sort of go through to construct a limit uh, sort of fall apart when you have to deal with infinitely many things at once. So if you have this class K, um, right, subclass of of F. So if this is a Presse class. Uh, then you can find a separable for Shea space E, which is approximately ultra homogeneous for K. Uh, and so that uh, K is precisely the collection of all linear subspaces of E uh, with a finite sequence of semi-norms. 
So I take all possible subspaces um, of this large space E. Uh, I equip them with finitely many sequences, right? Finitely many seminorms from E, right? Not, not with all of them, uh, but I stop up to some point. Uh, I look at the collection of all those spaces, and that's going to be precisely, precisely K. Um, so in the standard sort of setting, this um, right, this is usually referred to as as the age of the structure. So all finitely generated substructures, uh, but in this case, it's, it's something a bit different um, because we're not equipping right. We're not equipping these subspaces with every every possible seminar. We're just going up to some uh, some finite. Uh, some finite length of them, right? Okay. And of course, okay, so this space is unique up to isometry. Um, so it makes sense to talk about the the Fresalen of these classes. Uh, so I'm not going to go through all the details, but I'll give you the, the main sort of ingredients uh, of the proof here. So uh, first we construct a, a nice sort of co-final sequence uh, of structures coming from this, this countable subclass K tilde. So this, the sequence is meant to be co-final in a certain sense. So I, I want to take any, any element of K uh, and I want to be able to embed it uh, in some sense uh, into one element of, these, uh, of this sequence. So it's co-final in, in, in some embedding sense. Oh, and each of these sub ends uh, only has a finite sequence of semi-norms. So they're easy to get a handle on. Okay, once you have the sequence, you can form some sort of inductive limit. Uh, again, this isn't this isn't you know an exact uh, replica of the usual construction of inductive limit, uh, because here, right, when I'm taking the limit of these these structures, I'm they they have a different sequence of seminorms, right? Um, right, E sub n uh, isn't guaranteed to have the same number of seminorms as E sub n plus one. So we have to be a bit careful here, uh, but it turns out that you can do something something like an inductive limit. Uh, so you get a topological vector space uh, V together with an infinite sequence of semi-norms coming from this this cofinal sequence, uh, and then you form some com some form of some sort of completion. Um, but here we have to be a bit careful because uh, we want this completion to work well with respect to each of the semi-norms uh, individually. Uh, in particular, the notion of convergence uh, should be strong in the sense that if I have a sequence converging to some point x, um, that has to happen with respect to each each seminorm. So it's not convergence with respect to to just one, as in as in the case of phonic spaces. Uh, but I have infinitely many notions, right? Potentially infinitely, infinitely many notions of nearness. Uh, so that's sort of built into this this construction here. Okay. Uh, good. So we have we have a way of of turning for say classes into uh, for say limits, right? Which which give uh, a few examples, at least a few new examples of of structures which have this uh, approximate ultra homogeneity property. Okay. So now let's look at some examples. So the Garari space uh, fits this setting, right? So if I just look at the class of all Tall for shade spaces with one semi-norm. Uh, well, that's almost like the class of all finite dimensional uh, Banach spaces. So it turns out that this is the first a limit of, of the class F1. Uh, and it follows from the fact that G is the first a limit of the class of all finite dimensional Banach spaces. So it's 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 not really a new example, right? It's sort of known already. This example motivated um, was actually the main motivation for, for this work. So Okay, take take the product of cantilenary copies of of the Gurari space. So uh, in 2017, uh, Bargetz, Kakol, and Kubish showed that you can equip the space with certain sequences of seminorms that turn them into into for say type objects. Um, so there's this first sequence here of of seminorms which turn which turns G sub uh, right G to the n into a uh, G for say graded for shade space. So again, this means that uh, this space with this sequence of seminorms uh, is approximately ultra homogeneous uh, for this class G. So just the class of all finite dimensional for shade spaces uh, with a finite increasing sequence of seminorms. Uh, and 
you can do this in such a way that this space itself is is graded. Uh, and then there's something similar for, for the class of all finite dimensional for shape spaces with finite sequence of seminars. So, so the main question we had was whether or not you could um, construct these spaces using Frasé theory. Um, the original proof uses some, um, some sort of deep facts about the Gurari space, in particular the, the fact that there's uh, some sort of universal operator on, on G. So, so they use that to precursively construct this, or these nice sequences of the seminars. Uh, so it's it's not quite for safe. So that was sort of the reason why we wanted to, to see if it could be done from this point of view. Uh, and then finally, another natural example. So if you take, so if E is either one of these two spaces um, and you just truncate the sequence of seminorms up to up to the first N, well, okay, now you have a now you have a Frechet space with a finite sequence of seminorms. So call it E sub N. So it turns out that this is the Frechet limit of uh, either F sub N or G sub N, depending on, on where you started. Okay, so, so there's a few uh, nice examples. Um, and by when we're doing this, the hope is that these nice examples lead to new examples of uh, extremely amenable groups. Uh, and one, one question that, um, as far as I know, we're still not sure of. So, Right, just focusing on this first space here, uh, g to the n with the sequence of seminorms, which turns into a, an f for say for shape space. So it's not, it's still not clear if you can write this as a for say limit. So it, it has this approximate ultra homogeneity property. Um, but if you take the collection of all, uh, all finite dimensional subspaces, in some sense, you have, you have too many things there. So it's, it's actually not clear yet um, if this is the same as. Uh, the first say limit of, of just taking right, all finite dimensional for shape spaces with a finite sequence of semi-norms. So the, this, this space seems, um, at least on the face of it, it seems a, bit, a, a little bit bigger uh, than just the first say limit. So that, that's still open. Uh, but what we'll see is, is still going to work for these spaces. Um, okay. Uh, good. So Right, if we want some sort of correspondence between extreme amenability and the Ramsey property, we have to define a, an appropriate version of the approximate Ramsey property. So this is a sort of similar uh, to what we saw before. So again, you have a collection of finite dimensional for shade spaces. It has this approximate Ramsey property if whenever I take X and Y in the space, some number of colors R and some error epsilon, I can find a large enough Z uh, so that the following holds. Um, so whenever I color the embeddings, right, and remember that embeddings preserve all of the norm, all of the semi norms, right. So whenever I color the space of embeddings from X into Z with R many colors, uh, I can find this nice embedding uh, gamma of Y into Z uh, and some nice color I. So that this set, right, uh, if I look at the set of all compositions of the form gamma uh, with eta, say eta from, or where eta is embedding from X to Y. So this is contained in, uh, in this set here. So again, this is just saying that everything of this form is nearby something with color I. But now our definition of nearby is different, right? Now it's with respect to um, each of these semi-norms. Uh, okay, and just some, some notation to simplify things. Um, this set here is, uh, it's not quite the pre-image of, of the i color, but it's some, some epsilon neighborhood. Um, and in particular, it's the neighborhood with respect to, to each of the semi-norms that we see. Right? And if this happens, then we say that this set epsilon stabilizes. Okay? So again, it's not quite monochromatic, but it's, it's almost monochromatic up to some, some error. OK. Um, so again, if you go back to just um, right the space of all uh, first state spaces with one one semi norm, then this is this is essentially just the same as the approximate Ramsey property uh, for finite dimensional bonded spaces. Um, although there's a there's a key difference, right? Because now you're not looking at a space with a norm; you have a space with a semi norm. Uh, so there's some there's there's a few things you have to do there, um, and we'll see that in a second. Uh, but it's essentially the same same sort of thing. 
And I should mention that this, the approximate Ramsey property for finite dimensional Banach spaces. Uh, so right, the reason that was sort of developed was to, to try and show extreme amenability of, uh, here I wrote aught of G, but it's really just the uh, surjective linear isometry group, right, of, of this Gurabi space. Uh, so it was, for a while, it was unknown if the space was, or if this group was extremely amenable, um, which sort of motivated, uh, right, looking at this, this version of the, the Ramsey property for Banach spaces. So this, right, this has some, some success, is, is what I'm saying. Right? There was a uh, successful use of this, right, to get these extremely amenable groups. Okay, so now let's look at the topology on, on the isometry group of, of some crochet space. So if you have uh, space X, uh, you equip it, you equip the isometry group with the topology generated by these, these sets. So this is really just uh, the version of, of the strong operator topology in this, in this setting where you have uh, multiple semi-norms. Okay. So you have some isometry F, some finite dimensional uh, subspace Y of X, some error, right? And you just look at everything that's nearby uh, F up to some finite selection of seminoms. So you're not um, looking at every possible seminom, right? You're just uh, taking the maximum of the first, first N that you see. Um, so everything that's nearby in this sense uh, forms a basic open set. Okay. Uh, Good. So now if you have, right, so we want, we want a KPT for, right, this Hecker's test off to Dorchberg's correspondence in this setting. So if you have uh, one of these Frechet spaces, which is approximately ultra homogeneous, uh, and if you define K sub N to be the collection of all finite dimensional subspaces with the first N norms from E, right? So you're not taking every possible uh, sequence of semi norms, just the first N. Then it turns out that this, this collection, so K sub N, this has, uh, if, if each of these have the approximate Ramsey property, uh, this is the same as saying that the isometry group is extremely amenable. So this is kind of interesting, right? Because you're not, you're not looking at every possible subspace. Um, you're taking the subspaces, but you're, you're only focusing on one, one two semi-norms at a time, right? I only have to, at any given time, I only have to look at the first n, right? And I work with that class, and I see if that class has has this Ramsey property, and if that's always true, independent of n, uh, then you get extreme amenability. Okay, and the only thing I'll say about the proof is that it's 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 modeled after standard proofs of of this sort of equivalence. Um, the only difference now is that you're not considering every possible subspace; you're just looking at a nice nice sub collection. Okay, so now if we want to show that the isometry group of, of G to the N, right, one of these uh, for say for shape spaces that, we can, that was uh, constructed before, if we want to show that this is extremely amenable, uh, it's enough to show the approximate Ramsey property for certain nice classes of for shape spaces. So as I see here, so to show extreme amenability, we just need to show that uh, this class F sub N has the approximate Ramsey property. So again, just all finite dimensional per se spaces with uh, at most n semi-norms. So that's what we'll we'll try and do. Uh, and I should have, yeah, I should have time for, for most of that. So the first step is to uh, show what I mentioned before. So the approximate Ramsey property for, for Banach spaces is known, um, but in this case, we don't necessarily have a norm, right? We just have a semi-norm. So, okay, if you take any two finite dimensional semi-norm spaces, X and Y, uh, any error, right, epsilon, and any number of colors R, then you can find a large enough, uh, actually, norm space, uh, Z, so that whenever I color the embeddings of, of X into Z with R many colors, uh, this epsilon stabilizes on one of these, these nice sets. So, right, if I take any, any embedding of X into Y, and then I compose with this, this nice embedding row, this, this thing here is always nearby something with a fixed color. Okay, so let's, let's go through the proof. So I'll, I'll sketch most of it at least. So, okay, fix x, y, uh, epsilon, and r. 
So the, the trick is basically the same as, as what we saw before, right? So you take the quotient uh, by the kernel of the seminorm, right? So now you have, uh, once you equip it with these, these norms, you have, uh, you just have two finite dimensional Banach spaces, right? So now we want to use that here, right? So if you apply the approximate Ramsey property of finite dimensional uh, norm spaces, then you can find a finite dimensional uh, norm Z so that every coloring uh, of the space of embeddings of X into Z epsilon stabilizes on some nice set. Okay, so now we have this, uh, this nice embedding uh, row of, of Y into Z. And the claim now is that uh, this norm space Z actually works for the, uh, the initial parameters that we fixed, right? So we started with two semi-norm spaces. Um, the claim is that this, this same Z works, works there. So you, you get something a bit stronger than the approximate Ramsey property in this setting, um, right? For any two semi-norm spaces, I can actually find a norm space that works. Okay, so let, let's check that this works, right? So how do I do this? Well, I fix some coloring, uh, call it C, of the embeddings of X into Z, right, into R many colors. Now I want to use this to define uh, a coloring, call it C tilde, of the embeddings of X tilde, right, this quotient space uh, into Z, right? Because by definition of Z, I know how to deal with these, these sorts of colorings, right? Uh, Z was chosen so that, right, it, it satisfies the uh, Ramsey property for, for X tilde and Y tilde. So I know how to deal with colorings of this form. So I turn C into this, this, uh, this other coloring C tilde uh, as follows. So, right, I want, so I take some, uh, some embedding gamma of X tilde into Z, and I want to define a color for this, right? So what do I do? Okay, I take gamma and I just precompose with this mapping pi sub X, uh, where this is just uh, the canonical surjection, right? I just take a, an element, map it to its equivalence class under this, uh, this quotient, right? So I pre-compose with, with this uh, pi sub X, right? And I look at what color I have there. So that gives me a way of associating uh, a color to, uh, to these sorts of embeddings, right? Of X tilde into, into Z. So now I have a coloring uh, that I can do something with. Right? I have a coloring of C of X tilde into Z. So by definition of Z, this means I can find some nice embedding uh, row of Y tilde into Z, which epsilon stabilizes on some, some set of this form. Right? So whenever I take an embedding of X tilde into Y tilde and I compose with a row, I'm nearby something with, with color I, right? For some fixed I. So I, I have something that works um, right in the norm setting. So I have to sort of turn that back into something that works in the semi-norm setting. Uh, so if I right, if I pre-compose a row with pi sub y, right? So again, this is just this rejection from y to, to y tilde. So I claim that this, this does what we want, right? So we wanted some embedding of y into z, uh, which has this property, right? Which uh, which made the set epsilon stabilized. So, okay, take some embedding eta of x into y. If I want to use what I know from, from up here, I have to somehow turn this into an embedding of, of x tilde into y tilde. Okay. So what I do is, okay, I can just map the equivalence class of x to the equivalence class of eta of x. Uh, and here is, is, a, is a picture which maybe <laughs> is easier to digest. Um, Right. So I have this, this embedding eta of x into, into y. I have these canonical surjections, right? mapping something to its equivalence class. Right. Uh, so I turn eta into an embedding I can work with. So it, right, I get this embedding uh, phi of x tilde into y tilde. And now I go back up to, up to this line. Right? Whenever I have an embedding of x tilde into y tilde and I compose it with rho, I'm nearby something with color I, right? C tilde color I, right? So that's what's going on here. So I have um, this theta, right? Which has color I according to C tilde. 
and it's nearby uh, this composition, right? Uh, phi followed with, with rho. Okay, and uh, this does the job. So, um, right, we took some some embedding eta of x into y, and we found something uh, which was nearby with color color i. And the thing that has color i is this this map here. So I, I take uh, pi sub x and I compose with with theta. Uh, so now you just go back to the definition of, of what C tilde is. So it, it was defined in terms of these, these sorts of mappings. Okay, uh, let me pause here in case there's any questions. Okay, um, so hopefully the, the general strategy is, is, um, is clear, right? We, we, the point is that we know things about finite dimensional norm spaces, right? We know Ramsey properties of these, uh, these spaces. Um, so we can use that to work with, first of all, semi-norm spaces, right? So just in our notation, this, this collection F sub one, right? Some Frechet space with one, uh, one semi-norm. So what we need to do, and since we're only looking at uh, spaces with a finite sequence of semi-norms, you can basically view this as a finite sequence of semi-norm spaces, right? With, with the same underlying space. So the, the previous lemma is actually just the base case uh, in the proof of the following. So if I take, right, these finite dimensional semi-norm spaces, x1 up to xn and y1 up to yn, some error epsilon and some number of colors r, then I can find uh, big enough norm spaces, z1 up to zn, so then now when I color the product, so I take, so for each J individually, I look at the space of embeddings of X, J into Z, J. Uh, I have those embeddings, I take the product. Uh, so now, now I have a potentially more complicated coloring, right, into R many colors. So for any such coloring, uh, you can find these embeddings, row sub J uh, of the intermediate space into the big one. Uh, so that this collection here is now, um, Epsilon monochromatic. So it epsilon stabilizes uh, on some, some fixed color. So I won't go through the proof because uh, I, one, I didn't write it up, and two, I'm almost out of time. Um, but it's, if you're familiar with sort of product Ramsey theorems, um, the strategy is, is the same there. Um, <clears throat> so you have this one Ramsey statement that's, uh, that's true just for, for one of these pairs. Uh, and now you can extend it in a nice way to any uh, finite tuple. Okay. Good. So now we can we can actually prove the approximate Ramsey property for, for this class F sub n. Right. So I take. Okay. So I fix n. <clears throat> and I take two of these uh, for Shea spaces, both with n semi norms. <clears throat> Let's say some number of colors and some epsilon positive. <clears throat> then I can find a z that works. Okay. So I can find a z. Uh, in fact, it, it's not just any per space, it's actually graded. So you can set it up so that the sequence of semi-norms is, is increasing. Uh, but you can find the Z so that every uh, coloring epsilon stabilizes on, on one of these nice sets. Okay, so again, I mentioned this before, but the, the point here is that you have now a finite tuple of semi-norm spaces. So you look at them individually, right? So I look at X and Y, uh, with each semi-norm individually. So now I can apply the previous uh, result, right? This, this sort of product Ramsey result. So this gives me the sequence Z sub, right? Z1 up to Zn, uh, which work individually, right? And now what I do is, okay, since I only have finitely many, I can just take the product, right? I take the product and I define uh, a suitable sequence of semi-norms. And this is the same, this is similar to the sequence that we saw uh, when checking the near amalgamation property, right? So I just look at the uh, di coordinates uh, and I take the corresponding semi-norm there. Uh, and here I'm just taking the maximum to ensure that this uh, sequence of semi-norms is increasing, but um, that's sort of not really important for this. Okay, and the claim is that this, this space Z works, right? So again, how do I check this? Well, I take some coloring of the space of embeddings, right? Uh, and now I need to turn, so if I have a sequence of embeddings of, um, 
by x with the jth seminorm into z sub j, if I have one of these sequences, I have to turn it into uh, something I can actually work with. So if I take one of these sequences, gamma sub j, uh, we'll define a mapping. So f of the sequence gamma. So this is supposed to be a linear mapping from x into z. Uh, so what it does is that it just takes uh, some element of, z of, of x and it outputs this tuple. Right? Uh, and again, this, this works because right, z was just defined as this product. So you have this, uh, this nice way of going from a tuple, right, find a tuple of embeddings uh, into some embedding of x into the big product. So you can use this now to, uh, to define a coloring that you, work, you can work with. So the c hat, right? So this is supposed to be a coloring of the product of these, uh, these spaces, right? Uh, space of embeddings of x with the jth norm into z. So you just, right, if I have a sequence of these uh, embeddings, I just look at the color of f of that sequence, right? Okay, so I have a nice way of going back and forth between these uh, these two sort of viewpoints, right? Um, okay, so we have this induced coloring uh, c hat of this this product, and now I have to go back to the definition of the the z sub j's, right? So these were chosen so that uh, for any such coloring, I can find these uh, these nice embeddings rho sub j, right? From y with the j seminorm into z sub j, so that this space uh, epsilon stabilizes on some color. Right? So anything in here is nearby something uh, with a fixed color. Uh, but I was after, initially I was after some, some nice embedding of, of y into, into z, right? Not, not of y with one seminorm uh, into z sub j. So to do this, I just define it in a natural way. Right? So, uh, row of y is just going to be this tuple. So I just look at the coordinates uh, individually and I put them together. Uh, and it turns out that this, uh, this works uh, just by the way we, we, we set things up and by the way we define this, uh, this coloring C, C hat. Right? So we turn this, um, right? the point is that we turn this problem about these fresh A spaces with finite sequence of seminorms uh, into a problem about tuples of seminorm spaces with the same underlying space. Okay, so that finishes, you know, module of some details that I left out that finishes the proof of, of the approximate Ramsey property. Um, and so as a consequence, we get, uh, we get some new examples of extremely amenable groups, right? So this first space here was, um, right, was the, the for say, for shape space, relative to all of the uh, graded finite dimensional for shape spaces. Uh, and the second one here was, was for all of them without, without requiring um, that your sequence of timing norms is increasing. So if you look at both of these uh, spaces with uh, the, I guess, standard analog of the strong operator topology, then both of these turn out to be extremely amenable. Okay, uh, I think I'm almost out of time. So I'll pause here in case there's any any questions? Okay, and just to finish up, um, I'll ask you some questions. So here we were always dealing with some, right? When we were working with these fresh eight spaces, we were never working with an infinite sequence of, of seminorms at once. Um, we were sort of working with just a finite list and then building up towards uh, whatever we needed. So is the class of all finite dimensional fresh eight spaces uh, for say? So that's not clear. Um, it's not clear if there's a nice countable subcollection. Um, right? this, this version of separability, I'm not sure if it holds uh, in general. Um, and then other natural things you can ask, right? So here we dealt with um, right, these Frechet spaces or, or something related to Frechet spaces. Um, it's not clear if you have these approximate Renzi properties for, for things like quasi Banach spaces uh, or even, even F spaces, right? If you remove the requirement of local convexity, um, do you have some something like this? Um, it's not clear because we were working explicitly with these seminorms. Uh, and of course, to get these, you need some, some version of convexity. Uh, and then just, uh, uh, you know, if you're interested in this, this um, continuous logic sort of stuff, 
um, maybe you've you've seen this metro Fresse theory before. Um, so part of the motivation here was that what we were doing with Fresse spaces didn't really fit into this uh, the standard mold, I'll call it. Um, just because you have to deal with uh, an arbitrary finite number of, of uh, pseudometrics at once. So in the standard setting, you only ever have to deal with one uh, one at a time. Uh, here, it seems like there's too many to sort of to sort of work. So the question is whether or not there's a, a more general framework of dealing with with structures like this. Uh, okay, good. So I'll stop here. So thank you very much for for listening. All right. Thanks so much, Jamal. Uh... Are there any questions or comments? Also, I, I have a question. Um, yeah. So going back, um, I think you, I, you probably already partially answered this with your very last comment, but um, when you or you had a question on whether these, um, the, I think it was the, the your spare space at the end was also a, um, was in fact, the a Fresse limit of your um, mm. a GN and FNs. Yeah. And I remember in, in Benyakov's paper that there was a sort of equivalence between being universe, uh, being universal for your class and ultra homogeneous and being a Fresse, uh, a Fresse limit of the class. So mm. does this not apply here or is it, is it was universality missing? I, I, I think I missed something there. Yeah, I, I think the the problem is that um, this space G to the N with whatever sequence of the norms you, you want, um, I think it's too big in the sense that if you look at the age, um, you're, you're sort of capturing more than just the finite dimensional crochet spaces with a finite sequence of the norms. Um, so it contains all of them. Um, right? So you can have finite dimensional crochet spaces with an infinite sequence of the norms. So those are living in there somehow. Um, I get the so impression that it should be the same, but I haven't, I haven't thought too much about it. So is your, is, is the, is your class then, um, is it complete under, I mean, does it, cause it, it all, there also was notions of being like, um, having the Polish property where you have yeah. this kind of price metric and then it was complete under that metric. So mm -hmm. is there an issue there then or? So here, I'm not too sure how to, yeah, so I know what you're talking about, but in this setting, I'm, I'm still sort of unsure of how to make sense of that, just because, you know, okay, you're dealing with, uh, right, these topological vector spaces with, with some sequence of seminorms. Um, so if you only have to worry about a fixed number of seminorms at a time, then I think everything's fine because you can just take the maximum of, of all the seminorms that you see. Uh, but here, for example, so the class F that I was talking about, so uh, there is no uniform bound, I guess, on the number of semi-norms that you have. Uh, so to make it fit into Benyakov's framework, you would somehow need to have infinitely many of these pseudometrics uh, sort of floating around in the background um, that you would have to have access to. So th that's a good question, and it's something that I... I I should think about more because I feel like there should be some some simpler answer to some of the questions that I have. Um, but yeah, I have to I have to think about that. This is a very good very good talk, by the way. Oh, thank, thank you. you, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I do have a question as well. Thank you for your talk. If you can yeah. go back to the previous slide with your two new examples. With the examples. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, here. Oh. No, no, later on, later on. Just the theorem. Yeah, just before. Is uh, this? Here we go, yeah. Um, so, um, is there an argument to know that as topological groups, they are really new? I mean, could, would it be possible that actually that they turn out to be the same as the um, isometric group of the Gurari just as a topological group? It's, it's possible. Uh... But I would be very surprised just because these groups seem much more complicated. Um, again, just because an isometry now is something much stronger, right? You're preserving infinitely many seminars at once as opposed to just uh, the one from the Gurari. Uh, oh, yeah, I would be surprised as well, but uh, I was wondering yeah. what kind of argument one can use to show that uh, it's a new 
Yeah, no, I'm not sure about that. Um, I probably have to talk to Jordi <laughs> to see what he thinks. Um, we haven't thought too much about that, but that's that's a good that's a very good question. Yeah. Uh, okay, I have a comment uh, about your last question about the common framework. Uh, I wouldn't know at all if it would work or not. I don't really know this framework, but I know that Kubish uh, has developed a framework uh, a framework for pricey limits uh, of metric structures, uh, uh, which is metrized categories. I think everything needs is a distance between uh, between embeddings, but uh, you know uh, it's just uh, in the setting of abstract category theory. So uh, there there is no need of structure on the object themselves. So I don't know at all if it could work or not. But at least if you don't know about that, maybe that's something you should look at. This is due to who? I didn't quite catch. Vyslav uh, Kubish. Oh, Kubish. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay, I'll take him. Yes, of Kubish. I think he has a paper on this uh, on his web page. Yeah, or you can directly can ask him. He's very friendly. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'll take a look. Thank you. you. Just say. Sorry, it, it's something. So you're talking about. Um, I think Kubish has a paper on uh, for C sequences or for C categories or something. So is that what you're? That might be what you're referring to. I don't remember the exact. <laughs> So I don't remember because he has several papers. So I don't remember which one is a good one because there is one without metric structures. And I think there is one with metric structures, but I'm not sure. I oh, don't remember okay. right now. Okay, I'll take a look. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah. You should ask him maybe. That's maybe the, yeah. the right <laughs> that might be easier. way to do that. Yeah. yeah thank you. Okay, are there any others? Okay, probably not. Uh, thank you so much, Jamal, for a beautiful talk. Uh, we appreciate that. Glad to be here. Um, yeah, so.